Okay, Mr. Marshall, it is 6.33 by my computer. We have Amherst Media here with us. The attendees are coming in. You have a quorum. You look good to go to me. Okay, thank you, Pam. Welcome to the Amherst Planning Board meeting of May 3rd, 2023. My name is Doug Marshall and as the chair of the Amherst Planning Board, I am calling this meeting to order at 6.34 p.m. This meeting is being recorded and is available live stream via Amherst Media. Minutes are being taken. Pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021 and extended by Chapter, 20, Chapter 2 of the Acts of 2023, this meeting will be conducted via remote means. This planning board meeting, including public hearings, will be conducted via remote means using the, the Zoom platform. The Zoom meeting link accessible on the meeting agenda posted on the town website's calendar listing for this meeting or go to the planning board webpage and click on the most recent agenda which lists the Zoom link at the top of the page. No in-person attendance of the public is permitted. However, every effort will be made to ensure the public can adequately access the meeting in real time via technological means. In the event we are unable to do so for reasons of economic hardship or despite best efforts, we will post an audio or video recording, transcript, or other comprehensive record of proceedings as soon as possible after the meeting on the Town of Amherst website. Board members, I will take a roll call. When I call your name, unmute yourself, answer affirmatively, and return to mute. Bruce Colden. Here. Tom Long. Present. Uh, we believe that Andrew McDougall will be absent this evening. I, Doug Marshall, am present. Janet McGowan will also be absent. Johanna Newman. Present. And Karen Winter. Present. Thank you all. Board members, if technical issues arise, we may need to pause to fix the problem and then continue the meeting. If the discussion needs to pause, it will be noted in the minutes. Please use the raise hand function to ask a question or make a comment. I will see your request and call on you to speak. After speaking, remember to remute yourself. To the general public. The general public comment item is reserved for public comment on items not on tonight's agenda. Please be aware the board will not respond to comments during general public comment period. Public comment may also be heard at other times on specific topics that are on our agenda during the meeting when determined appropriate by the planning board chair. Please indicate you wish to make a comment by clicking the raise hand button when public comment is solicited. If you have joined the Zoom meeting using a telephone, please indicate you wish to make a comment by pressing star nine on your phone. When called on, please identify yourself by stating your full name and address and put yourself back into mute when finished speaking. Residents can typically express their views for up to three minutes or at the discretion of the planning board chair. If a speaker does not comply with these guidelines or exceeds their allotted time, their participation may be disconnected from the meeting. Okay, so our first item on the agenda this evening is the minutes. And we have two sets of minutes to uh, review at least. Uh, the first from March 15th, and uh, so I wondered if anybody had any comments on those minutes. I do not see any raised hands from board members. Okay, so if there were no comments, why don't we go straight into a vote on those minutes. Um, so can I have a motion to approve the minutes for March 15th, 2023? as drafted by our uh, staff members, Chris and Pam. Uh, Johanna, you get your hand up first. I move to approve the minutes. Thank you, Johanna. And Tom? I will second. Okay, thank you. Any further discussion? All right, we'll go straight into our, our vote. Uh, Bruce, motion? 
I'm going to abstain, Doug, because I was blown out of that meeting before the discussion really got underway. Okay, thank you. Tom? Approve. All right. Uh, I'm going to approve. Johanna? Aye. And Karen? Approve. Great, thank you. That's four votes in favor and one abstention for those keeping score. So the next set of minutes is uh, for the meeting where we actually didn't really meet. <laughs> um, and I guess I was a little surprised to see that there are minutes, but that's fine. Um, however, I, I and Chris and Pam were the only ones who attended. So uh, Chris, is it true that in order to approve these minutes, we need more than my vote? Uh, because I, you know, I was the only one there. Yes, if that is true, I believe, but others can vote even if they weren't there. Okay. Well, I have reviewed these minutes and they do seem accurate to me. So uh, you have my endorsement, even if you don't, you know, even if you haven't listened to the recording of this, of that minute, of that meeting <laughs> on the website. So, uh, Tom, you have your hand up. I will move to approve those minutes. Okay, these are the minutes for Wednesday, April 5th, just for anybody not seeing them in front of them. Johanna. I second the motion. Okay, thank you. All right, so uh, we will go again into our board vote. Um, Bruce, uh, I'll ask you if you wanna take a chance and vote to approve these minutes. Oh, I can hardly wait, Doug. It's a super solid yes vote from me. <laughs> okay, thank you. And uh, Tom? I approve. All right, I'm an I as well. Johanna? I. Okay, and Karen? Approve. Thank you. Okay, that's five votes in favor uh, and no abstentions. Great, thank you all. So we'll move on to the next item on the agenda. That is our public comment period. And right now it is about 640. And uh, at this time, I usually read uh, the participants from the public that I can see. Um, and so I will read the names as they appear on my participants list on this Zoom uh, software. The first one is someone named John, and he has his hand up, so we will need to bring him over for a comment. Then we have Dorothy Pam, Ira Brick, Jennifer Taub, Mandy Jo Haneke, Mara Keene, and Pat DeAngelis. Okay, so Pam, would you please bring John over? Mm -hmm. And uh, John, uh, please unmute yourself. Give us your first and last name Oops. and your street address, assuming you're in Amherst. Can we hold, can we wait just one moment, John? Yeah, I yes. I, I think I gave you three hours to speak, and that was. I'm not, not going to take two minutes. <laughs> so let me just fix this. Three. I could talk for three hours. Yeah. All right, let's give it a go now. Thank you so much. Yeah, right. my, name's, my name's John Boothroyd. I, I live in um, South Amherst. Um, and I'm uh, very concerned about the And um, I, I hope that I'm coming through fine on Zoom. I've never used Zoom before. <laughs> Seems well, relatively try, easy. Try huh? to stay near your microphone because your, your voice did drop out once already. Okay. Um, you know, my, my basic question for you is there's a lot of properties being talked about, which is um, the two school properties. Um, there was free property from Amos College. And I want to know what's on the list for those properties from the planning board, specifically, what is the, what are we planning on doing with those properties? I know we have, you know, we want to relocate the dpw we want to put in new fire stations uh i mean i know there's a group of people want affordable housing and these properties are kind of available on um you know i'm a little bit upset about the school which is mainly i'm trying to get involved with zoom in that they haven't had a conservation commission meeting yet and you should all be aware that that was the old 
basically industrial port for when we shipped out fishing poles, 60% of the world's fishing poles. There's a canal runs under the school and there's three brooks used to run under the school, one of which is buried in, in the culvert still flowing down there. So, you know, I mean, in, in reality, it's a problematic, there's a lot of problems with that school and it hasn't been before the CONCOM yet. And my understanding is, I'm hoping it comes before them realistically, which means if you want to knock it down, I believe you can't rebuild anything. And I guess, you know, I'm really starting with the planning board, just, you know, what are we planning on doing with all these properties that we're juggling around? You know, we have, I guess, a nice piece of property on high ground. And um, I guess I was very upset that everybody seemed to think that uh, it's cheaper to build on uh, Fort River School. I mean, they really need to raise it a lot more than they're planning on raising it. And they should not be digging in the clay, which, which the Fort River sits on. And that, that is basic, and that is the floodplain for the Fort River, and it sits in the Connecticut River floodplain also. And like I said, that used to be a canal, and um, you should all be aware of the, you know, the fact that we used to make all the gas to run all the gas lights right there out of coal, and that they've been pumping coal tar out for years, like, I mean, like the last three decades, I think. And they're saying their well is clean. However, most of it is probably still there encapsulated in globs all over the place, which is, you know, typical. Springfield has a huge problem. Amherst has a big problem with it. And so the, I don't know how much of this comes up with the planning board when they're, you know, because I believe most of these plans come before you first, right? Uh Typically, uh, we don't respond to comments or questions uh, during this period, but uh, you know, we, we don't actually uh, see the plan for the school and we haven't seen it yet from this board. Okay, so, so okay, so, so, so any, all right, so when does the board see the plan? Oh no, I, I mean, I should be, I, I'm sorry, I guess my three minutes are up. My main yeah, question is yeah, I'm hoping yeah. that this board you know, does have a list of these properties and a list of things that people want to do. And then, and, you know, we get them all on the table and not just, you know, as they come up. Okay. Well, those are good comments, John. And I thank you for learning Zoom, how to use Zoom and uh, coming and giving us those comments. We'll have to think about those. Well, considering how easy it was, <laughs> I haven't signed up before. Okay. <laughs> but right. I do. All right, thank you. Okay, so I also see Janet Keller's hand. Uh, if we can bring Janet over, and just a reminder, Janet, this is for this is the time for comments about items not later on our agenda. So this would not include this, the duplex zo zoning proposal. Welcome. Uh <clears throat> Thank you. Um, I did want to comment. Um, I'm sorry I'm late joining your meeting. I'll wait until later in the meeting. Thank you. Okay. All right. Um, so Pam, we can probably put her back in the attendees category. And at this point, I don't see any other hands from the public raised. So I believe we can go on to the next item on our agenda. And um, so this item number three, which we're starting now at 647, um, is in fact the continuation of the hearing on the, zone, the proposed zoning amendment, which uh, under, for, our, for shorthand, I'll just call it the duplex and triplex amendment. Um, as proposed by uh, two of our town councilors, Mandy Johanneke and Pat DeAngelis. So pursuant to chapter 20 of the acts of 2021 and extended by chapter two of the acts of 2023, uh, this meeting is being conducted via remote means and is being held for the purpose of providing the opportunity for interested citizens to be heard regarding Zoning bylaw, Article 3, use regulations, Article 4, development methods, Article 9, non-conforming lots, 
uses and structures and Article 12 de definitions to see if the town will vote to amend Article 3 use regulations to change the permitting requirements for owner occupied duplexes, affordable duplexes, non owner occupied duplexes, converted dwellings and townhouses to create more streamlined permitting pathways for these uses, to remove the use category subdividable dwellings, to add a use category three family detached dwelling or triplex, to add a permitting pathway and standards and conditions for triplexes, to modify standards and conditions for other housing use categories, to amend permitting requirements for housing use categories in the aquifer recharge protection overlay district, to amend article four development methods to add three family dwelling where appropriate, to amend article nine non-conforming lots uses and structures, to add a reference to three family dwelling, to amend Article 12 definitions to add three family detached dwelling unit or triplex and to delete subdividable dwelling. So tonight's meeting uh, is, uh, or continuation of the hearing is continued from March 1st, April 5th and April 19th, all of this year. And uh, as published in our agenda, uh, our conversation tonight is going to principally focus on the proposed changes for duplex uh, apartment units or residential units. Uh, are there any board disclosures for this, uh, for this conversation tonight? I do not see any. All right. Um, I see we have Man we had Mandy Joe, but we have, oh yeah, there's Mandy Joe and there's Pat. Uh, do you all want to say anything this evening or have you? Uh, given us all the introductory comments uh, in previous meetings that you'd like to make. Uh, Pat, I see your hand. Yeah, thank you. Uh, we feel like we you don't need to be reintroduced to this topic. Uh, we've all done a lot of talking about it, and it's an important topic. We feel like Chris has put out a new memo. Um, you have questions. Our goal today is to answer any of those questions and to address uh, Chris's memo. Um, Mandy, do you want to say anything? Uh, nothing on that. I just want to say thank you for having us. I do need to leave at 7.05 or so. So when I cut out that, that will be for that reason. I have a prior engagement that I have every Wednesday that I can't miss. Okay. Well, thanks for joining us for a few minutes. And obviously, board members, if you have any specific questions for Mandy Joe, we might want to direct those to her in the next... Uh, Looks like 14 minutes. Okay, um, so without an introduction, I guess we can go right into a conversation. Um, uh, Chris, is there anything you wanna say about the memo that you issued or issued probably yesterday and revised today? Um, or should we just go right into our conversation? I'll just bring people's attention to the memo that um, I am. Uh, I have expressed concerns about a certain aspect of multiple um, owner-occupied dwelling units on properties and how they should be permitted. Um, and my recommendation is for a special permit from the Zoning Board of Appeals if it's over a certain number. So um, just um, note that I have sent an, a revised memo to the planning board and to the proponents and a revised sketch that accompanied it. And um, we don't need to talk about that now. We have um, some questions that Bruce Coldham has put together, which seem um, more relevant. I think my um, memo kind of focuses on a very narrow piece of the proposed zoning amendment, and I think it would be more worthwhile to address Bruce's questions, which are more broad. And I did not forward Bruce's questions to the board as a whole, but Pam has them. We received them this afternoon. And if Bruce is inclined, um, perhaps that would be the better use of the board's time to go to start to go through Bruce's questions. Okay. Um, let's see. Pam, do you have uh, his questions that you can put on the screen? I believe so. And uh, Bruce, is there anything you'd like to say in 
as we bring those up? Um, only, Doug, that this is a follow-up from my commentary last time when I just found that the, uh, the breadth of the proposal, um, though quite detailed and quite specific, was uh, overwhelming in that you began to uh, talk about one area and then you quickly could move or to another and, that, uh, and retaining focus was what I was finding very difficult. And I finished by saying that it, it was in, I, I felt we were in danger of just endless continuation. So I thought about this a bit and I thought, well, what would it, how could I break this uh, um, or how could I divide this up in the way that I proposed? I mean, conceptually, how could I, how could it be actually divided up usefully so that it could be uh, constructively considered by, by a group here and, and essentially by the town? And, and so I, uh, um, basically took a pen to the uh, to the, the the diagram and broke that diagram up into five category topic categories, and then for each topic category, I basically um, expressed what I think Mandy, Joe, and Pat are asking us to uh, contemplate. But I reduced it to a, a, a few questions in each category, and so that's what uh, Pam is probably about to show us. Can you see it? Because I feel like I'm sharing it. No. Um, no. Okay. I mean, I have it up if you want me to share it. Well, what I don't understand is why you can't see it because... Um, I wrote it in code. Does that make a difference? <laughs> no, I'm, I'm... What is going on? Um, hold on. I'm going to try one more thing. I think we saw it for a moment. I think we did. I'm. I could be wrong. I, I didn't. I didn't think. Okay. Okay. Hold on. I'm going back to square one. Well, Andy, Joe, and Pat. While well, they're waiting, you shouldn't be concerned about this because really, what I'm trying to do is to is to. Well, it would have. It would have been helpful to get your questions uh, in advance. Um, and if That's, we're looking at duplexes well, tonight. Actually, so. actually, Pat, these are not uh, sort of questions for you. They're just more how, how in terms of the proposal you made. I you... understand what they are. OK. Yeah. So, so so far as duplex is concerned, I think the proposal can be reduced to uh, three questions that we're asked to consider. As uh, so far as triplexes are concerned, uh, I personally thought that we first needed to uh, uh, decide that a triplex category was a was a useful thing to to introduce, and uh, I have a footnote at the bottom which uh, observes that the triplex moves uh, construction into uh, the broad uh, category, uh, the broad field of the general building code, and out of the one and two family category. And to the extent that these uh, smaller buildings, including triplexes, would be primarily built by small builders, it seemed to me that there might be uh, builders who would who would uh, be nervous to venture into the broad uh, code, and they might, for that reason, choose not to build triplexes. I don't know that that's true, but I think we should establish that that is or is not the case before we spend time um, uh, trying to understand how to. Uh, uh, regulate it. Then there are four questions uh, related to converted dwellings, uh, which I think uh, are the uh, summary of what we're being asked to consider. And I think there's really only one question in townhouses. And of course, there's only one question in survive, subdividable dwellings. And I found that looking at these 10 questions, which I think is the total here, um, that made it so much easier for me to understand the task before us. And insofar as it was helpful to me, I thought it might be helpful to others as well. So I took the trouble this morning to write it down and, and to send it in. And Mandy Jo Pat, I didn't feel empowered to send it to you. I only send it to Doug as chair, the one other uh, board, my, my, my one other board member and to Chris, the uh, planning director. But I, I didn't feel empowered to send it beyond that. Well, thank you for doing that, Bruce. 
So since we're focusing tonight on the duplexes, Pam, why don't you scroll up to the duplex questions? Okay, so that answers my question. You can see this? Yes, we can now. Okay, so here we go. Great. Great. All right, thank you. Okay, so the first, first question regarding owner-occupied and affordable duplexes, should they be allowed by right? in all five of the residential zones and currently requires a special permit. Um, board members, are there reactions to that question that you would be willing to share? All right, uh, well, I guess I will offer, um, you know, uh, I spent a lot of time actually this week thinking about this proposal uh, focusing on the duplexes. And the more I think about it, the more I really felt that this, although I agree there's a housing problem in Amherst, this is not at all the way I would have approached it. And it's not at all the way I've been thinking about it. Um, perhaps taking my cue from the master plan and the desire to build up our village centers and our downtown as expressed in that document, um, I have felt that it would make more sense for us to focus on how to uh, increase density in those uh, village centers uh, and, and not sort of uniformly allow greater development everywhere or you know, most parts of town. Um, so I'm not particularly excited by this proposal. Uh, I wouldn't call myself a supporter uh, I guess the question for me is just how much I should, how much energy I should spend uh, or you know, opposing it, uh, you know, does it really make a difference? Because I'm, I'm also not convinced that we're actually going to have a lot of people that want to take uh, advantage of the owner occupied duplexes. Um, so that's my initial thoughts. I did have some other some concern about allowing more development in the aquifer recharge district, especially things like uh, fuel oil tanks that come with oil heat. Um, I know most people are trying not to do that anymore if they're thinking sustainably, but uh, having storage of essentially pollutants, uh, more of those over our aquifer recharge district seemed like a poor idea to me. All right, so I'll stop there for the moment. Bruce, I see your hand. Uh, yes, Doug, uh, I found, uh, uh, I, I started off um, being broadly supportive of, uh, of, uh, of the proposition expressed in uh, question A in the first question, um, because I thought of owner occupation uh, uh, as being uh, well regulated by the uh, ownership side of the duplex and uh, and also uh, living in a duplex or at least I did for a while it, and, and our co-housing community here is constructed entirely of, of, of duplexes grouped and clustered duplexes and it always felt to me that what we've done here should have been uh, should not be permanently uh, constrained uh, by a special permit and, and I think it's worth remembering that uh, I think I'm correct, and this has certainly been the uh, certainly been the reality of, of our life here at Pine Street Co-housing for 30 years. That if you want to do anything, uh, even a small thing that requires a building permit, and pretty much everything requires a building permit these days, if you're subject to a special permit, in order to get the building permit, you have to first go back to the zoning board uh, and uh, and and get their blessing. So it's a it's not just a complicated. Uh, uh, first step, uh, complicated in a, a good way, I think, for the first step, uh, or certainly a reasonable way. But for the subsequent uh, 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 improvements that one wants to do, put in a ramp, uh, um, a few other things, porch maybe, it does seem uh, uh, an imposition to have to uh, go first to a, a special permit authority, then go to the building inspector and then get your permit if you are... Um, uh, uh, regulated the way it currently is. So generally speaking, I was in support of uh, this first proposition to allow affordable and owner-occupied duplexes by right. Um, the comments that Christine and the planning staff have been making recently, and more especially the, the, the uh, memo that Chris put out today, um, 
has has brought me up a little here because I've realized that uh, uh, um, that uh, multiple duplexes could be uh, um, uh, imagined uh, to be or could be uh, uh, um, uh, could be allowed on these properties, multiple duplexes and. And I thought, well, multiple owner-occupied duplexes, that seems rather odd, but I suppose it could be um, the, the parents in one and the kids in the other, or it could be um, uh, uh, some kind of a, a shared arrangement uh, where um, someone, you know, basically it's a, it's a tenants in common arrangement or something. But after I read Chris's du uh, memo, I realized that... Um, and I don't think this is my imagination running wild, and I don't want to start uh, being too uh, paranoid about this thing, but I think it is quite reasonable to imagine, particularly where you had properties that could have you know, three or four duplexes, and, and we've seen one come before us at the Local Historic District Commission recently. It seems to me that a, an enterprising uh, developer could create an LLC as the owner and instead of offering rental agreements uh, to students, they could offer LLC memberships and that you could uh, essentially create an owner-occupied duplex um, uh, virtually uh, identical in function and, and occupancy to a non-owner-occupied duplex simply by uh, constructing and managing an LLC as the owner. Um, and I, I would want to make sure that uh, we um, ironed out that potential uh, uh, unintended consequence before I would be supportive of this. Um, so that's a real concern of mine, even though it sounds a bit esoteric and, and it may not be everybody's idea of what would be possible, but it could be one, one person's idea. And then if it was successful, it could become more than one person's idea and it could be a, a wholly uh, destructive unintended consequence. So I got that from reading Chris's email and thinking a little bit about it. And, uh, uh, and so that would be a reservation that I would have. So, Doug, I think broadly I'm in your camp at the moment, um, uh, wondering how hard I should uh, resist this, having started from the position of uh, general support. Well, Bruce, thank you. I, I actually did a similar uh, thought experiment with my own property here. I have a basically a half acre lot. I have a 100 by 200 lot, so it's 20,000 square feet. I'm in the RG district. So for the first family on the lot, I need 12,000 square feet. That leaves me 8,000 square feet uh, to, to put additional families on my lot. And for each additional family under the current zoning, I would need 2,500 square feet. So I could do another three families on my lot. So I could take my house, either split it or add to it to make it a duplex and then uh, put a second duplex out back. And uh, that would be four families on my half acre lot right in the RG district, just down the street from the middle school in a neighborhood that would probably freak out when I did that. Um, so, you know, I don't know, maybe I wanna do that and uh, build my nest egg, but uh, you know, I think that is somewhat drastic. All right. Um, anybody else want to make any comments? Doesn't sound like it. Doesn't look like it. Oh, Tom, thank you. Yeah, thanks, Doug. I, I was going to say that, you know, since the beginning of these conversations, I've felt um, a lot of and I think that that's still a driving factor for me in the way I look at this. And hoping to bring um, density to places with public transportation, hoping to bring density to village centers um, or, or places that are designed for density rather than distributing that density around, um, you know, more rural and, and not so, um, space is not ready for it necessarily with infrastructure. So. Um, so I would tend to lean towards um, an agreement that um, this seems to combat some of the goals of the master plan in terms of um, focusing density. All right. Thanks, Tom. Um, Johanna, great. 
substantively, I don't feel like I have much new to add, but, you know, uh, share Doug and Tom's sentiments that we want to be directing density and we want to be directing development proactively to the places where as a town we've decided we want it. And, um, you know, again, I'm a little bit like, I, I hear Bruce's point. Um, I think probably the owner occupied is, uh, I'd be curious if we have a number, like total number of units that are currently in this category, just how much it, you know, like, I don't think it would open the floodgates to development. And so to some extent, maybe this is a way to address in the short term, some of our housing challenges without giving up too much of our like larger development goals as a town, if that makes any sense. All right, thanks, Johanna. Uh, Karen, anything you want to contribute? Um, I I read Chris's memo and I totally agree. I think I would feel very uneasy without uh, limiting the number of um, units on a lot. I think it could really uh, destroy a neighborhood in that if it happens next to you, you you'll get out. So um, I I think I would I'm I'm really not in favor of uh, leaving it as it is. It's too open and too vulnerable. We we don't know what will happen. And I and I agree we should have density in certain places and try to keep. Um, open sort of your, you know, the beautiful uh, rural atmosphere in, in other places. And we have to be cognizant that we, we're also protecting neighborhoods from what's happening next to them by uh, giving them the chance to weigh in when something happens. And I think that's that's really important. It's important to, to have uh, builders have freedom, but it's also important that neighbors have the right and, and the ability to weigh in on what happens next to them. All right, thanks, Karen. One thing you reminded me that I was thinking about was, uh, you know, I think uh, Mandy Joe and Pat had cited or mentioned that there were a number of other communities around the country that had essentially gone this direction and allowed uh, duplexes and, and didn't have any, eliminated all the zones where only single family homes were available. And I guess I was, I haven't looked at, researched it up, but I wondered whether many of those places might be more, more uniformly developed uh, already. Uh, something like, you know, uh, maybe Longfellow or, or rather Longmeadow or, or some of the dense suburbs around uh, Boston, where they don't really have a lot of open space to have to be threatened or to be, you know, that could still be developed. And one of the things I do like about Amherst is that there are highly developed areas and there are quite rural developed areas. Um, so, Pat, do you do you have any sense of the sort of characteristics of the towns that have done this and you know are they really applicable or relevant to our situation um the one to, uh, i'm nervous that's why i don't like to talk but um st paul is a, a community in minnesota they they're in st paul and other areas in portland they've expanded uh the missing middle uh, by doing infill in a certain kind of way um what I see happening is, um, if I go to Chris's plan that the the uh, the Lincoln Avenue property that she used in her memo, uh, if we're looking at that, that happens to be an area that is set uh, next to uh, Amherst College. It is uh, quite. A dense area, and it is exactly where we're saying we want to increase density. Uh, 
you know, I know that her original drawing was incorrect. There are fewer units that would be allowed on this property. Uh, and what I hear is a resistance to um, really looking at proposals that might change the amount of housing that we have. And I hear words from all of you like, um, uh, it, we can imagine that these would all be inadvertent consequences. LLCs would be doing these awful things and we'd be renting to students and neighbors would freak out. And from what I understand, whether it's a special permit or a site plan review, abutters do need to be notified and abutters do have the ability to address issues. Um, <laughs> So uh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not able to list more towns for you and I will find some of that out. Um, okay. Well, but, I mean, obviously- But I, your well. fear, the fear in that you guys are expressing really is distressing um, in many ways. If we look at um, Ball Lane, the proposed Ball Lane, we're talking about 15 duplexes of different heights and sizes we're talking about retaining open space there. And it's going to be a quite an incredible development for first time homeowners. And I'm trying to understand why that jeopardizes the character of our town. I'm having trouble understanding what the character of our town is because what I see it is, is to, to talk about socioeconomic diversity, to talk about, um, welcoming people in all neighborhoods. And yet what I hear you guys doing is being afraid of that. So Bruce, right. you have your hand up. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. So uh, we've heard that St. Paul and Portland are the two. Yeah, and I'll get some more. I can send it out. Model, two of the uh, predecessors who have considered and done this. OK. Yeah. All right, um, Bruce. Sorry about that. I just wanted to assuage Pat's concern that, uh, Pat, it's it's our job to think about this from all points of view. And we would be derelict if we didn't. And just because I can come up with something that might be an unintended consequence doesn't mean that I'm trying to shoot the project down. What it means is that I'm trying to identify something that need would need to be fixed for reasonable support to be given to this. But please don't confuse uh, due diligence with uh, uh, with negativity. It's not fair and it's not right and it's not appropriate. Uh, we have to do our job here. And uh, I'm damn sure trying to do mine. And I put a lot of time and effort into this and I'm putting a lot more time and effort into it. Well, like and if we can fix this uh, unintended consequence by, uh, by putting something in the... Uh, in, in what we might eventually draft, then that's what my uh, observation is intended to achieve. Okay, thank you, Bruce. Tom, I see you next. Thanks, Doug. Um, Pat, I just wanna be clear that um, I don't wanna confuse duplex with building diversity in a neighborhood like ours where those are likely to be swept up by students as well. Um, so I'm not sure that we're building diversity by building duplexes. I understand where you're coming from and I understand what the objectives are. We've also had lots of other discussions about whether or not this actually will serve the, um, the end users that we believe it is. So I don't want it to be confused as one leads directly to the other because I don't think that that's actually the case. All right. Thank you, Tom. Pat, I do see your hand. Thank you. Thank you. I just wanted to correct something on Bruce's third question. Um, he is a non-owner occupied duplexes are currently allowed by site plan uh, review and a uh, site plan, special permit, sorry. And I think you're referring to the aquifer recharge protection district in that question, but I'm not sure. Um, okay. All right. And, and due diligence, Bruce, you're absolutely right. Due gil, diligence is incredibly important. And if there's a one, we talked about 
um, adding deed restrictions and things like that to the um, owner occupied duplex um, bylaw uh, section of this bylaw. So if, if you can expand on that or help us do that, that would be quite incredible. All right, thanks, Pat. Uh, whoops. Mr. Marshall, if, did you notice if Ma um, Ms. Haneke is still with us? Uh, she left right at 7.05 as okay. she uh, promised she would. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, Chris, I wanted to ask you one question um, because uh, some of the concerns that were, were raised in your memos uh, were, were stemming from the relatively new interpretation of section 3.01, I believe it is, uh, of, the, of, the, of our bylaw and, and it, the fact that uh, it seems we've, we're creating a precedent to allow more than one principal use on a, on a and on any specific lot, and I wondered if you could tell us, um, you know, where is that new interpretation coming from? Is it is it some of the individuals uh, in the in town hall, or is it a uh, a, a wider uh, uh, perspective? And, and maybe, you know, is, is, is that particular section something that we should be thinking about amending um, or changing in some other way uh, as we consider this uh, bylaw proposal? Um, I think that you might well consider amending section 3.01. I'm not exactly sure what the wording would be or exactly what the intent would be, but I think it has the potential for um, for being overused or exploited. Um, and it is a new interpretation. I think as I've listed in my memo, at least one of the memos, it has been taken advantage of several times by the Zoning Board of Appeals or by applicants before the Zoning Board of Appeals. And to date, the um, results have been good, but they've been very um, small small developments where multiple um, buildings are being allowed. Uh, we have a new one coming before us where there's a triplex on a property in on Fearing Street and um, applicants are proposing to, to, to put two, well, they had proposed to put three duplexes there. We understand that they may be con reconsidering that and only proposing to put two duplexes, but uh, and that's the kind of um, development that uh, if they're not owner occupied, they're um, going to be a non owner occupied. But in any event, I think that those things might be um, worthwhile to allow to occur, but they should be carefully controlled. And I believe that um, special permit through the Zoning Board of Appeals is a good mechanism for that. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question, but it is something that's becoming more more known in town, more people who are developing properties are becoming aware of this um, opportunity to, to have their multiple principal uses on a site to be declared complementary, and therefore they're coming forth with um, applications. And so far, all the applications are by special permit. Okay. All right. Um, I think I, I think it was in one of your memos that you also talked about the uh, potential use of a condominium development uh, to essentially take a single parcel, put a couple of duplexes on it, turn it into a condo so that each, you know, each building or each unit was a condo and therefore at least one of those units in each building would be owner occupied. Um, how, you know, we don't have very many condos, at least around the center of town. Um, how difficult is that? And, and is turning, you know, Bruce cited the LLC uh, scenario. How plausible is a condominium development sort of scenario? Is that- I think it's easy? quite plausible. Um, Marsh House, 
which is a development at, um, what is it, 151 Amity Street is a condominium. It's the old Amherst Funeral Home, which was divided into two units and three units were added there. And those are all owner occupied and they're beautiful units. So I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with condominiums. Um, just saying that it's possible for a developer to come in and take a piece of property and to create owner occupied units. It's not necessarily something that you know, a brother and sister decide to bring their families together and have an owner occupied unit. It's quite possible that a developer might do that. Another example, I think, is um, I think there are some duplexes down in or uh, Upper Orchard down uh, near um, what's it called? Applewood. Yeah. Uh, and some of those units, those units are owner occupied. Um, so it is something that people might be very interested in um, having an owner occupied duplex and what i'm suggesting i'm not suggesting that developers are evil in any way but some of them get carried away and i think it's really good to have some careful scrutiny and the zoning board of appeals is a group that is used to giving careful scrutiny to projects. And I'm not saying that the planning board isn't, but the zoning board can say no. The zoning board can say, you have too many units on this property, you need to take some away. Even if the units would be allowed by lot area and additional lot area per family, even if it would be allowed by um, dimensional um, regulations, the zoning board can say, we think that's not appropriate in this, in this location. Um, and the other other thing then is that if if owners uh, or if, if abutters um, disagree with um, a decision of the Zoning Board of Appeals, they have an opportunity to appeal that decision. It rarely happens, but it does happen from time to time. Um, and I think that in the case of something that is rather intrusive and big, it is appropriate for um, abutters to be able to appeal if they find something is really difficult to accept. So the two things taken together, the ability to deny and the ability to appeal, I think are what makes a special permit different from site plan review with the planning board. And I think that for larger um, projects, it is a, a necessary form of um, review. So I think, did I answer your question? Yeah. Thank you. So Pat, you I see your hand. Yeah, I just wanted to mention a few special uh, permit conditions that have happened around town. Um, at 266 East Hadley Road, which is South Point Apartments, part of the uh, language includes that you can't uh, have a guest stay with you for more than five days and you have a, a maximum of 10 guests per unit, guests per unit, which means you might want to have a Thanksgiving uh, dinner with family, or you might want to um, have uh, a birthday party for kids, and you would be uh, uh, in danger of, uh, <laughs> because of these limits, you would not be able to have your sister stay over five days in your apartment. At, at 290 West Street, which is a non-owner occupied duplex, uh, it says the interior of the uh, the special permits of the interior of the two family residence shall be used only as labeled on the floor plans prepared by the home store and stamped and approved and amended by the zoning board of appeals in 2009. Does that mean a, a room labeled uh, dining room can't be used for an office or it um, the, it just, it just gets to me because it feels like this is the places where you're discriminating against students. But if I go to families, um, 3739 Fairview Way was a two family, it was originally a single family home. It became a two family home. Uh, and then with the family daughter of the parents, the, the, <laughs> the people who started the family living in the, uh, uh, second floor part, and then they changed, they converted their garage to an ADU, and their son lives there. So the idea that family members or sisters and brothers might not want to live together, I think is inaccurate. And what I feel like is some of the uh, special permit 
on the Fairview property was all grass areas shall have a maximum height of four inches. This is a private home. What if they're deciding to make it a meadow, which is what I'm trying to do with some of my yard. The maximum number of people on the premises at any time shall be 25 people. Sounds like a lot of people, but if there are three yeah, units there um, and they're talking about a, again, maybe a party, a gathering, the maximum number of overnight visitors per unit shall be four people with a maximum stay of seven consecutive nights. How come these are in conditions of special permits on a private home, basically? And, and so when you're looking at this, you're really, I, I guess I need to you guys to open up your minds a little bit about what family is, what community is, what renters are, and, and where they need to be, and where first-time homeowners need to be. Because, I don't know, the, the, the Fairview home was the home, is the home of a person who used to be on the planning board, and they still got these kinds of bizarre conditions. So, well, I mean, it sounds like those conditions came from the zoning board, and, um, you know, we don't, we don't do that. <laughs> we can't really do that. Um, and uh, sounds like you have a little bit of a libertarian streak in you, uh, as I do, but uh, we all have to live together. Uh, Bruce. Um, uh, uh, I've been subject to those kind of conditions too in the various uh, uh, particularly here at Pine Street Co-Housing. As I said, we've got quite a number of special permits here. And, and I think the, the answer to what Pat's questioning is that, first of all, typically those kind of uh, weird uh, conditions that get uh, are largely a function of a, of a passionate uh, abutter who's got a concern. I know that uh, we have uh, on our house here a condition that we're not allowed to have unregistered cars on the property. And that was because my brother-in-law had garaged his car an unregistered car because he lived in Alaska in the trees out behind our house for one year. It just happened to be the year when the planning board visited. So my general sense about these kind of weird conditions is that you more or less ignore them and behave properly. And that uh, it does mean, however, that if there is an abuse there, that there is a basis for an abutter or for somebody uh, to leverage uh, a result. But I don't think that just because you've got a limit of whatever it is, 25 people or some sort, it doesn't mean that there's a somebody who's going to be coming in and inspecting you every now and again to make sure you're complying. You just live your life and ignore it. And providing you are respectful of the world around you, no one really is going to come in and, and hold you to the letter of some of these ridiculous conditions. I think this is just a function of strenuous about our representations at, plant, at zoning board meetings. All right, thanks, Bruce. Uh, Chris, your hand. Yeah, I wanted to agree with what Bruce is saying. Um, the Zoning Board of Appeals puts conditions on, actually the conditions that were put on 290 West Street were conditions that came out of the management plan that the proponent of that project put forward. So um, often the Zoning Board takes things from the management plan and things from things that, um, and the lease that the applicant has has stated. And many leases say you can't have more than 10 people on your property, or you can't have more than one person who is limited to staying uh, three nights. Um, and mostly that's to control students and students who may um, choose to have more than four people living in their um, dwelling unit and, you know, take advantage of, oh, this person is just a guest and allow that person to stay for weeks or months on end or to um, have a, a party, a gathering that causes disruption for neighbors. And you know that there have been such um, parties in Amherst um, and I don't think I need to describe them. Um, so it gives the um, building commissioner and his staff um, the ability to regulate these things. And if they get um, a complaint from a neighbor that there was a really rowdy party in this um, on this property and there were over 25 people there, um, that is an indication that um, the 
the inspectors can enforce the conditions. Normally, they don't enforce those types of conditions unless there are complaints. They have no reason to drive around neighborhoods and count the number of guests who are um, at any particular location um, unless there's a problem. But it gives them the ability to enforce things if there's a problem. And I think that, um, generally speaking, the conditions that are put on by the Zoning Board of Appeals are very reasonable and they're discussed with the applicant. Um, they're certainly more reasonable these days than they were in the past, um, but I don't have um, I don't have any reservations about the zoning board putting unreasonable conditions on special permits. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Chris. All right, so um, board members, you know, I kind of started the conversation saying I was basically unenthusiastic about this proposal and uh, but I wasn't sure how much I should really resist it. Um, we got a number of uh, several others of you who kind of were in the same boat. Um, you know, I guess, you know, I mean, I know we're missing two members tonight and we probably would want to include them in what if in any decisions we made. But, uh, you know, I think if that's kind of the general sense, um, you know, I wonder whether we uh, want to, uh, you know, what we're going to want to do with this, uh, how many more meetings we're going to want to talk about it, and, um, you know, whether we're going to want to just sort of give it as tepid a recommendation as we can, or whether we're going to actually want to reject it. So I just put that out there so people can start thinking about where are we going to end up. Uh, Bruce, I see your hand. Doug, I was going to go to the uh, uh, item C. I was going to skip B for the moment because I thought you made a. Uh, uh, well, actually, I won't skip B. I, I I think that I might put a condition on this one that I could support it if uh, if there were uh, if they were uh, non fossil fuel um, uh, um, houses, powered yeah. buildings. Yeah. Um, but otherwise, the uh, the concerns that I have on B would be the same as A. Uh, they can probably be reconciled. I I, I could probably be uh, persuaded with uh, with with appropriate uh, conditioning to support A and B. Uh, number C is is uh, the non-owner occupied duplexes. Duplexes are more uh, a problem for me, uh, as I've said previously. I think that. It's not going to solve uh, the, uh, the 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 housing problem. I think uh, um, uh, the, uh, the 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 market for for student uh, rentals in this town is so high, and and I think I would be supportive of this proposition with um, um, if we were to move to. Uh, and I'm halfway through this uh, work that I'm doing on talking to other cities and towns around the country and, and how they are uh, regulating student rentals in their neighborhoods. But it seems to me that uh, as far as I've gotten on this, that we would probably want to have a, a, an identification of a student home, formal identification of it, and to have some... Uh, um, controls uh, um, uh, on um, student homes, either their distribution, uh, density, you know, uh, dis dis yes, distribution, and and perhaps uh, uh, an elevated uh, rental fee uh, to the extent that uh, um, uh, I mean, I, I I don't want to come across. And I guess I should repeat this every now and again, just to be sure. Uh, student occupants in this town are very important. They're a large part of our town. They're uh, slightly over half of the town, in fact, I think. And many of them don't live on campus. Many of them live around. Some of them live in Sunderland and other places, but many of them live in, in Amherst and many of them live in, in rental uh, 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 duplexes or, or single family houses. Um, and uh, they can be good neighbors. I was one once, you were, everybody here probably was. Um, I remember enjoying the places I lived. I also remember occasionally, uh, to my shame, uh, not behaving as well as I might have when I was 10 or 15 years older. Um, that's the nature of being a 20-year-old. 
Um, so it occurs to me that uh, non-student occupied duplexes, particularly ones that were essentially student homes, probably should expect to have a higher level of um, regulation. And um, in order to make that affordable by the town, they probably should pay uh, a higher uh, rental fee so that we could afford to pay for another John Thompson or two and then have uh, uh, regular inspections. Uh, whatever it takes to uh, ensure, really, that um, the transitory uh, occupants, such as year-to-year uh, -year rentals for students, would become welcomed in the neighborhood. Um, and I think that that's gonna require some uh, kind of identification of a student home as an entity, and then having identified it, put certain uh, strictures upon them that will um, guide them towards being uh, um, uh, good neighbors. So that is essentially the project that I've been working on and continuing to work on uh, in my private time. This is not something that the boards has asked me to do or charged me to do or that I'm doing formally on the board's behalf. It's something I'm doing because I think it's necessary and I am taking it on myself. And I will probably in the course of the summer, um, maybe the next month or two, I've got two, three uh, meetings, uh, Zoom meetings with uh, planning directors from other towns around the country in the next week. And, and, and I've got another nine that I'm trying to line up. So I would imagine in the next month or so, I should probably know a lot more about it. But my general sense is that to support, for me to support non-owner occupied duplexes as a, uh, uh, by right, um, I would uh, uh, certainly want to have some parallel uh, uh, regulatory structure around identifying, formally identifying the student home and uh, putting uh, regular fixes on student homes that would uh, um, uh, cause them to be good neighbors. Thanks, Bruce. I want to clarify one thing, and I think your question is, that you've written here is actually not quite true, um, because currently non-owner occupied duplexes are allowed in the RO. Yes, Pat, Pat noted that, and, and basically I pasted the, uh, the currently not allowed in the wrong place. Uh, that should be up on item B, 1B, and, and the currently requires SP should be down on 1C. So you're both correct. That was yeah. a... That the, was only a change, the only change to non-owner occupied duplexes that's proposed is in the aquifer recharge district. Uh, they would go from being prohibited to being special permit. Yes, did I say that? Yes, I did. Yes, that's correct. So, so uh, the the document was done as best I could in the time. Yep. Uh, and I okay. I knew there'd be mistakes like this, even though I couldn't find them. But <laughs> uh, but you all certainly once this things goes out, it's you quickly find the errors, which is good. Um, Chris has a has a, a editable copy of this, so. Uh, she has some edits she would like to make as well. So to the extent that this has a life beyond this meeting, uh, uh, Christine has the, uh, okay. is in now in charge of it, I think. Okay, thank you, Bruce. Pat, I see your hand. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, let Bruce know um, that uh, CRC Community Resources has been for many months now working on rental registration bylaw and changes in fees, changes in, uh, in uh, definitions, et cetera. Um, and we're getting it ready, Mandy Joe and I and Pam Rooney and Jennifer Taub and Shalane Balmilne have all been working on it. And it addresses a lot of the issues you brought up. And so it might be very interesting for you to share some of your research with us and uh, find a way to collaborate on that. All right, thanks, Pat. Absolutely delighted to do that. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll... I'll do. I'll. I'll send you the questions that I'm asking right now. Okay. Um, I don't see any more board member hands at the moment, and there is one hand from our public attendees. So why don't we just go to that person? That is John, and I believe John commented earlier. Uh, I didn't quite get your last name, John. So when we bring you over and you introduce yourself again. Uh, why don't you give me your last name a little bit more clearly than so than I got it last time? 
Mr. Marshall, can I just ask, when you look at the timer, do you see it correctly or do you see a mirror image? I do image? now see it correctly. It was reversed, uh, sort of mirror <laughs> image before. Okay, thank you very much. You fixed that problem. Uh, well, I had fixed it earlier too. Okay, <laughs> okay hold on. Here comes uh, Mr. Boothroy, I believe. Hi, John, can you hear us? Uh, yep, can you hear me? We yes. can. Welcome All back. Right. Yeah, I, I, I believe this, um, I, I read the whole zoning change you're talking about on uh, one of the uh, websites. Um, and I, in general, I was in agreement. And um, sorry, but the dogs are barking. I, um, but uh, my one comment at the end of this, the originals, they want everybody to hook up to the sewer, which I believe is not what we need to be doing. Okay. Uh, um, they said that, that their requirement was to hook up to the sewer. I believe the UN has said we should be uh, basically recycling all of our, you know, waste and composting it. And, you know, we will save gigantic amounts of uh, fertilizer. And uh, obviously it's difficult for people to do. So it needs to be worked out, but there are a lot of fancy things, but the requirement that you have to hook up to the sewer should be, you know, <laughs> I, I, I think that is a little bit extreme at this point in time, because that is probably one of the best things we can do for the environment. If we can figure out how to do it easily and automatically <laughs> anyway other than that you know i i have 37 units on a single family building lot on one side of me and five units on a single family building lot on the other side of me so my opinion is you should be allow me to build 12 or 15 units on my lot whether i like it or not whether you like it or not i mean i'm looking at four stories behind me and they don't meet the setback and anything, they don't meet any zoning requirements. But anyway, so I mean, I, that's a unique situation, I guess, but obviously, so I'm rather jaded, but yeah, I believe that people should be allowed to believe duplexes in their owner occupied duplexes, they should be a private matter, not part of the rental board. Obviously, if you're not around and you're renting it, that's a different story. But anyway, thank you very much for your time. And uh, you know, I, I, was, I enjoy listening to you all. And hopefully you take note of the sewer requirements in the uh, <clears throat> right in the uh, zoning rules you've been discussing, if you could. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so we've had a couple more public hands come up. Um, next person is Janet Keller. Janet, why don't we bring you over and you can remind us of your street address and we'll, you have three minutes. Thank you. Hello, Janet. We do hear you. Great. Um, thank you for the opportunity to comment and thank you for the careful thought uh, you are giving to these important matters. Um, in addition to uh, uh, very much wanting to see the abutters uh, notices retained since they're small part of the developers uh, costs and uh, to get uh, a project underway. Um, they're critical to preserving the, uh, the rights uh, and the uh, ability of abutters to speak to projects. Uh, I did want to speak also to um, Pat DeAngelis's uh, concerns about uh, that people will uh, object to the Ball Lane project. I attended the meeting, the public meeting on the 26th and sent a letter uh, supporting that project. I live diagonally across from it and um, my sense at the, the, that meeting, that public meeting, 
was that there was great appreciation for the care which uh, Valley CDC and uh, Peter Flinker and the architect put into consulting with neighbors, carefully citing that project, um, soliciting input from the neighbors. And so, um, and it is indeed a, a project that is well cited. It's across from um, Pulpit Hill Road, uh, 120 Pulpit Hill Road, which has a similar development on a larger parcel of conserved land. Um, and I, I just wanted to clarify that there is quite a bit of enthusiasm for that project. And um, I particularly support it wholeheartedly. Thanks. OK, thank you, Janet. Uh, the last hand from the public I see is from Pam Rooney, uh, our counselor, our liaison to the town council. Pam, why, welcome to the meeting. Why don't you do the usual introduction? I'm Pam Rooney. Thank you for letting me speak. I live at 42 Cottage Street. I am not speaking as liaison. In fact, I forgot the meeting was tonight, so I just tuned in. Um, I was was thankful for the uh, report from the planning department and um, was have have given some thought to sort of the conundrum or not the conundrum but the also opportunities that are that are are allowed us with section 3.0 which allows for multiple multiple um, principal uses and and therefore multiple units and combinations of units that are possible and i would love to hear um the planning board's consideration for the idea that if there are going to be more than four units on a basic lot that in fact that does that does revert a project to um, special permit or a zba review um that could that could anything over four units could be a single family home plus a converted dwelling. It could be a number of duplex, uh, triplexes, or it could be multiple duplexes. And uh, reading through the, the memo from um, Christine Brustrup and the sketch shows that, that certainly just because it's a type of housing called the duplex, I think really what we are dealing with is what is the what is the opportunity of a site and what are the impacts of a site in in um, placing essentially more than a couple of dwelling units on a property and because you when you when you get to more than a couple of dwelling units on a property you have a lot of other issues you have runoff you have parking you have uh, you know the amount of impervious surface Etc. And you have you have buffers from neighbors, and so um, just given the fact that we have we have really um, delved into the realm of multiple principal uses, I think um, not that I don't love the planning board, but I think the the opportunity for a site a special permit review by by the ZBA. I think just lends the scrutiny that is probably appropriate when we have multiple units on a property. So I, I really appreciate the planning board thinking about this. Obviously this comes back to CRC for further discussion, um, but I really look to you for, for giving this kind of a thorough vetting um, of the issues that are that are raised um, by this. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Pam. Uh, another hand has popped up. We have Dorothy Pam, another counselor. Uh, if we can bring Dorothy over. Dorothy, you should be able to hear us and 
Okay, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Welcome. Yeah. Okay, I'm just going to speak as a resident of my neighborhood and to point out that one of the biggest problems in affordable housing is the cost of construction. The condos that you referred to, the March, Marsh condos, are indeed very lovely and they are really, really expensive. Um, I think of the best thing that we've done for affordable housing in residential areas uh, or in the town is the inclusionary zoning because that does result in some affordable units in nice buildings. Um, the, even with the ADU, the cost, the very few individual homeowners, well, at least certainly not, a, not we, um, can afford to actually make use of the land that we have in an ADU, which I think I like the idea, but um, the, the, the cost of them is very, very high. So I think our future of affordable housing is things like Ball Lane, where there is, we have to have public money. The federal government used to be the major financer of public housing in New York City and of middle, middle income housing as well, the Mitchell Lama bills. Um, and the, the, what's been happening in Amherst that is affordable is either town donated land or other money coming in. And that is well, the way we're gonna have to go. I guess it's a lot of work, but we're really making a good start. Um, we need to do a lot more, but the builders, their costs have really gone up and they, their, their aim is profit. So they're not going to result, they build anything in rent for rents, certainly not for people with low income. And really, I think as Pat said, we've got a real problem with the missing middle. And that's a group of people that I think we need to really concern ourselves with. So we, we have to go after public money or use town land um, to try to build some of the more affordable houses, which I hope, I hope we do. So that, that's my comment. Okay, thank you, Dorothy. Uh, Pam Rooney, I still see your hand. Is that a legacy or, or were you hoping to come back? Okay, it looks like it's gone. Okay, so board members, uh, we're coming up on eight o'clock when we usually take a break. Um, you know, I guess I'll mention a couple of things that have kind of been drifting through my mind. Uh, one is, uh, you know, if we're not really enthused about this particular solution to provide more housing, uh, not just affordable housing in Amherst, um, you know, we really need to be prepared to work on coming up with us with our own proposal um, and uh, putting that forth for consideration. We can't just say no. Um, and I guess the other thing is, uh, you know, this proposal has been fairly broad in, in terms of the number of residential zones that it applies to. And so it does uh, respond to at least one of the comments we got, I think, from Jennifer Taub at one point, uh, like, why should the RG district be the ones to take the brunt of all new development? Why shouldn't we distribute it more broadly among all the people in town? And at least my answer is that the, the most carbon friendly way to develop is to take the densest areas and make them more dense. But it doesn't really, that's probably not a completely satisfactory answer to somebody like Jennifer or me who lives in the RG district. So, um, unless anybody else has any comments, why don't we stop and we'll take a five minute break. Uh, the time now, uh, according to my clock, is 7.57. So why don't we all try to come back at 8.03, 8.02, 8.03 after a five minute break. So please mute yourself and turn off your camera. And then when you come back, please turn on your camera. Thank you.
All right, I have 803 on the clock here. And I'm seeing a couple people come back. I guess one other question I could pose would be, uh, you know, have we talked enough about duplexes tonight? And, you know, since we agreed we weren't going to go further into this proposal, uh, how much longer do we want to talk about it this evening? All right, there's Bruce. Let's see if Johan will be back soon. I'm back, sorry. Not a problem, Johanna. Okay, the time is 8.04. And uh, I, I'll repeat what I said earlier uh, before everyone was back and, and that was just, uh, is there more conversation about the duplexes that we want to have tonight? Uh, since we kind of agreed to focus on those, um, or do we want to kind of stop here tonight and, and move on to do triplexes and some of the other things uh, at our next meeting? Bruce. Um, Doug, I just wanted to, uh, in reflection on over the break, I think I. I think I, I want to say that I'm broadly uh, um, supportive of the uh, duplex um, uh, questions, with um, with the with the qualifications that I mentioned. With the uh, uh, I, I like the uh, the the uh, amendment that Chris has proposed in her memo and the structure. Number one, number two, I like uh, the uh, that that we should do something to. Uh, Prevent any some unintended consequence of rotating uh, ownership through uh, the use of a LLC. Number three, I think that in the aquifer zone there should be non-fossil fuel uh, um, powered buildings, and in uh, um, the non-owner occupied. Uh, uh, again, I like the, uh, the 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 structure the way Chris has put it. And I would uh, like to see some kind of uh, identification of a student home and appropriate controls placed within uh, the uh, the, rate, the uh, rental uh, bylaw. Uh, subsequently, I don't imagine that would happen in the first round, but at some point, I think for those four. Um, uh, caveats or conditions, whatever, uh, provisos, uh, I could be supportive of the, uh, of, of this section of the, uh, what Mandy, Joe and Pat are proposing. I thought that might help folks um, because I really didn't declare myself too much earlier, but I thought it might be useful to do so. And I know we still haven't got uh, Andrew and Janet, so I expect that we, we necessarily continue deliberation on this because they've both got a lot to say, I'm sure. Okay, thank you, Bruce. Uh, is there anything anyone else would like to say uh, from the board? Uh, Johanna, and, and I do see, I do also see one more public comment. So uh, John, don't worry, we'll, we'll get to you. Go ahead, Johanna. Thank you. Um, and I'm sorry if I missed this at some point in the presentation, but do we have a sense of, um, I don't know, just, just how many units we're talking about 
with the duplexes and how, you know, yeah, how with this change, do we have a sense of how much of an impact it would have across town? Okay, so, and, um, you know, I, did, I don't know whether you've seen some of the information that Chris forwarded from Janet. Um, there was a an email, I think, that came to all of us this afternoon that uh, had some numbers for ADUs, uh, which were approved back in November of 2021, and that there had been 11 ADUs approved since then, um, that that was a 20% increase. I don't know exactly how they calculated that. Um, and the third bullet in that email said uh, that there that the cost of a of one or two family house construction was in the 225 to 275 dollars a square foot range. Um, I will say personally that strikes me as low because I've been hearing much higher numbers than that. Uh, but that may be coming from Rob Moore and the building inspectional folks who uh, you know see the building applications, the building permits for, uh, you know, uh, one and two family home construction. Um, I also thought, uh, Chris, do you have the numbers up available? There were some numbers we got from, uh, that had the number of duplexes in town. Um, I'm wondering whether I should, <coughs> excuse me. Yeah, see if Nate, I... Nate or Pam should have those. Um... So we asked Rob Mora, let's, let me give these uh, time in a sequence of time. Rob Mora said, um, the last report we did here, we showed 249 rental two-family buildings. Mm -hmm. And then he said he thought there were around 400 total with owner-occupied, with the owner-occupied properties um, but he wanted to get that confirmed. Okay, there it is, yep. And then there was another email from Kim Mew, who was our assessor. And I don't know if you have that one, Pam. I do, it just takes me a minute to, to, to get switch. it. Yeah, right. I think. Well, since I can't share my screen at all, I'm hopeless. <laughs> I That's... admire you and your skills. Here you go. There we so, are. Kim Mew said we have 340 two family homes and 278 of those are classified as duplexes. Um, and they they categorize things differently from the way the zoning bylaw does. And then she attached a whole long list of duplexes. And um, so I don't think that that would be terribly useful to you, but the numbers here are interesting. Um, Amherst has over 9,000 dwelling units. And Nate Malloy is here. And if you want to ask any more particular questions about numbers of dwelling units, he might have that information. He's our housing expert. Okay, thanks, Chris. So, uh, Johanna, that doesn't tell you how many are likely to come. It just tells you what we have now. Yeah, but it's helpful to get a sense of the universe of duplexes in the context of our larger housing stock. And okay, I think those are all the questions. Okay. I have. You know, I, this is making me think that it's a nudge that could make an impact with relatively small environmental footprint, but that could just help help expand housing in ways that you know, kind of using existing structures in a way that could be beneficial. And it, it's not revolutionary. I think we need other measures too. But I'm, I'm warming to the idea and I like some of the guardrails that Bruce is suggesting. Okay. So one other th thought that I'd had was, you know, an, an inverse way to think about how would we double the number of houses, you know, in a neighborhood, uh, instead of doing duplexes, we could take the minimum lot size and cut it in half and say, you know, instead of 20,000 or 12,000 square feet now in the RG, you can do a 6,000 square foot lot. 
Um, and that would keep parcels individually owned and um, they would still be single family homes. And, but you know, the cost of the land ownership would be cut in half. So maybe they'd be more affordable and they would, that would allow more ownership rather than rental. So, you know, Pat, I don't know what you think about that. I see your hand. Why don't you go ahead and comment? It's an interesting idea, but um, just think about it in a slightly different way. Reduce the lot size and uh, build a duplex. Duplexes are uh, less expensive. They're um, environmentally more sound because you're heating, you have that common wall and you have a generally smaller structure. So I like your idea, but you need, I would like you to push it into the realm of duplexes. Okay. All right, so why don't we go to our one public comment hand. Uh, John, come on back and give us your next three minutes of uh, commentary. Hello. Uh, Hello again, John. Yeah, well, thank you for listening. Um, I, I believe what's coming up and they're trying to work out zoning is for tiny houses to be put on people's lots, which I believe is part of this discussion is tiny houses um, slash trailer parks. But I don't think we want trailer parks. I guess a tiny house is a little bit of an upgrade from the traditional trailer. But um I just hope that you do some of that. I mean, my, my daughter has a tiny house. We parked at the backyard and we move it around. And, you know, she wants to compost everything, which, you know, and obviously hooking up water in the winter and stuff is very difficult, <laughs> but it can be done. Um, so I'm hoping that, you know, that yeah, I don't know where the tiny houses part of this is. Is it, is it, is it part two or is it part of this or tiny houses are not explicitly mentioned in this proposal at the moment so i know uh, they're discussing it right uh i don't know of any discussion within the town uh boards or committees that are uh you know likely to result in any zoning changes uh so uh Hold on, Pat. Uh, let's let Tom. Let's let John finish, and then uh, if you have a response, you can respond. Then go ahead, John. What? Well, I I heard that there was something going on in, with respect to that. So uh, I, I believe at the town council level. Okay. Well, maybe maybe I'll be corrected. But um, anyway, but thank you for your time. I guess that's you know. I mean, the rest of it. I mean, you guys pretty much covered everything. I guess. <laughs> thank you. Okay, thank you, John. Uh, Pat, did you want to comment? Have there been tiny yeah, houses? I just wanted to say that the Housing Trust has had a presentation on tiny houses, uh, and there are some members who would like to see that uh, brought into Amherst, but there is no council action or anything like that going on. Okay, yeah, great. Okay, we also have a couple more hands uh, from the public. Pam Rooney, why don't you come on back? Thank you, Pam Rooney, 42 Cottage Street. I would love some clarification, uh, particularly on the assessor's um, numbers of dwelling units. And I think it's very confusing to all of us that we talk about roughly 342 family houses, but only 278 of them are considered duplexes. And I, I just think that's, we need to really, uh, let's clarify our terminology I would say if there are 342 family buildings in Amherst, I would consider them duplexes. So let's uh, let's just clean up our our words. Same with with uh, triplexes. You know, are they considered three family or are they triplexes? It doesn't really matter. You're talking about the number of units in a building. Um, the same with a a converted dwelling. If there are four units in a converted dwelling, great. Let's call it a a four unit building and not get stuck on the word duplex or triplex or converted dwelling. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Pam. 
I do remember that I think that Chris mentioned that the assessor has a different definition from the building inspector and the building code. So uh, they are probably not at liberty to change those definitions because they operate within a larger regulatory environment. Um, from my point of view, the discrepancy is not particularly significant because it gives me a sense, both numbers give me a sense of the sort of order of magnitude of that type of dwelling in town. All right, Jennifer Taub, you are next. Let's bring you over. You've got three minutes. Hi, Jennifer. Can you hear me? Yes, now we can. We okay, I'm sorry. Um, Jennifer Taub, 259 Lincoln Avenue. Um, I'm speaking as a resident. And I did want to ask us sort of um, acknowledge that I had talked about concern about making the densest, the residential district, that zone for the greatest density to concentrate further densification there. So I'm assuming when you suggested cutting the um, lot requirement, it was for all districts, not just the RG. But I would argue that um, in the general residence district, you only need 12,000 square feet for the first dwelling. Um, and then, um, you know, 2,500 to 4,000, depending for the second dwelling. So we are zoned for a great deal of density. I think to make it 6,000, as actually the planning department um, mentioned at the last community resources committee meeting, that people didn't move to Amherst because we wanted to live in Northern Virginia or we, you know, wanted to live in Long Island. We did live in Amherst to have some green space. And I live in the, you know, in a, I, on a small lot in the most densely populated residential zoning district in town, but to have it be cut in half, you know, at that point I should move to Somerville, frankly, and have the amenities of a city. So, I mean, I kind of just threw it out there, but it's something to consider in the RGs, you only need 12,000 square feet for a house. You need 20,000 in the na uh, residential neighborhood, the RN districts, which are a lot, many more um, neighborhoods in town. Why not make the RN districts 12,000 square feet like the RGs? That I just throw it out there because that could give you um, many more houses. So that's it, thank you. Okay, thank you, Jennifer. And Pam Rooney, your hand is either still up or back up again. Uh, okay, it's down now. All right. Okay, board members. Have you had enough conversation for this evening? Do you want to continue this to another meeting? Anybody have any thoughts? We've agreed we'll talk about triplexes and converted dwellings and uh, the other parts of this proposal at, at a later time. Bruce? Um, Doug, I'm not sure. Are you looking for a, a motion to continue or to move on to the, uh, the yeah. traffic conversation? Well, I didn't think we were likely to talk about triplexes tonight. That's As good. We, in that case, in our I... agenda, we were pretty clear it was duplexes. I think you're right. I did see some reference, but it probably wasn't an official. So that being the case, I would uh, move uh, that the. Uh, Can we continue the hearing? Continue the, the hearing uh, to uh, and meeting, then uh, uh, May seventeenth at six or what uh, six thirty five, Chris. That is fine. Yep. I think that's fine. Let me ask Pam. Yeah, Pam hold on. Hold on one second. I just want to look. Um, we do potentially have three other items, none of them which are have a specific time, though, Chris. So if you want to do six thirty-five, I think that's reasonable. Well, are, are the other items likely to be relatively contained in the conversation and? something we could cycle through and then get to this or you know, I think I need... two of them are pretty lightweight. One has to do with a tent at the Jones Library and one has to do with the shed at the survival center. So I think those are pretty lightweight. We also talked about talking about the lighting policy that Mandy Joe and Anna Devlin Gothier are developing, um, but we could reschedule that. And Janet wanted to bring the um, GZA site assessment survey 
to the planning board and um, that was a possible night for okay. the site assessment survey. So I think it would be better to have this first and then maybe cut off um, discussion at, you know, 7.30 or 8 o'clock and move on to other things after that. Okay. All right. So Bruce, uh, we're, moved. we're working out your, your motion here. <laughs> So May 17th at uh, 6.35. Yep. And uh, I'll go ahead and second that. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to continue the meeting. Um, board members, do you have any discussion you want to take before we, uh, I guess, vote to uh, continue this hearing? I don't see any. OK. Um, all right, so we have a motion on the table, a second, and we'll go through a, a vote. Uh, Bruce, do you vote to continue the hearing? I do. Okay. Uh, Tom? Yes. Uh, I'm a yes. Johanna? Aye. And Karen? Yes. Okay. Great. So uh, Pat, thank you for joining us this evening. And uh, sounds like if you'd like to come back in two weeks, we'll be continuing the conversation. Thank you. All right. All right, the next item in our agenda Old business. Right. The time is 824 and we'll move to item four in our agenda is old business items not not anticipated 48 hours in advance. Do we have any Chris or Pam? No old business that I'm aware of. No. Okay. Uh, new business. Oh, I'm sorry, Karen, I see your hand. Uh, you need to unmute. No. Yeah, I, I didn't. I don't have old business. I, I wanted to speak to new business. Okay, so we're at new business. Go okay. ahead. New business. So I propose that the planning board invite to their a meeting, not in the too far distance, the town manager, so that we can have a specific conversation with him about the crisis, uh, um, having more um, more of a back and forth with the university about the housing crisis, because I feel the students are demonstrating for them it's a crisis. I, I don't think this is something that we can just um, wait and, and fun, funnel some of our information to Christine who funnels it to the town manager who talks to the university. I, I really think it would be a very good thing. Our constituents have again and again pointed out that the housing crisis, which is caused by a too great a demand for student housing in this small town, this small town, which is, you know, um, pretty vulnerable, that that is of a major concern and we should address it. So, um, yeah, let's invite the town manager and have our questions and I just have a back and forth. This is not any kind of an attack. This is just a brainstorming, a, a seeing how we can uh, open channels of conversation with the town uh, in a broader way than it's being done right now. Because this is a this is a, a a crisis which has to be addressed now, not also in the future, but also now. Okay. Um... Chris, is that something you could talk with Paul about and see when his calendar, you know, when his schedule would allow him to come uh, meet with us? Certainly I can do that, yes. All right. So uh, Karen, you post that as a motion. Um, do you strongly feel we need a motion or are you okay with uh, like that we need to second it and vote on it or? or no, or no, no. Oh, okay, I, I, so perfectly. you're fine. You're fine, fine. With, with Chris, perfectly fine. and we'll just get it on the get it on the calendar. Okay, good. 
Did you have anything else? Nope. Okay. All right. So I'll put down your hand. And okay, did uh, Chris or Pam, did you have any other new business not reasonably anticipated? Nope. Okay, great. All right, so the time is 828. And do we have any Form A, a and r subdivision applications? No, not tonight. All right, how about uh, ZBA applications that we might be interested in? We do, there's actually two here, but um, I'm wondering if we have already talked about 485 Pine Street. If we told you about that. It's a, um, it's a dwelling that it's basically an illegal duplex that is coming to the ZBA. Um, I'm not sure that there's a date scheduled for that. Nate, you might be able to help me out if there is a date, uh, but it's coming before the ZBA for a special permit to make it legal. Am I correct, Nate? Yeah, sorry. Yeah, it's not. Um, you know, I'm not sure when it'll go before the ZBA, but you know, it's a it's right next to Cushman Market. It's a larger structure. It had been used informally, or it had been used as a two family. It was never permitted. So really, it's a it's a single family that they're being um, it's requested to become a non owner occupied two family. Mm. All right, Pam, we're seeing the timer over some email. Yeah, that's not yeah. what I wanted to happen. I wanted to, um, I had tried to have um, the GIS up so I could show you that it was next to Cushman, but I'm not this, being this successful. This is the large house that's to the right as you look at Cushman? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, what aspects of that might be of interest to the planning board? Is, is it sort of about what makes a duplex and, you know, in light of the zoning application or the zoning bylaw we're considering? Um, I'm not sure that it would be of special interest to the, to the planning board. However, it, it is coming before the ZBA. So we okay. tell you about all of them. In okay. case you in case you want to. All right, uh, Bruce, I see your hand. Yes, I, I live up in this part of town. I know this building well. Uh, it's always a peculiar thing. And uh, my experience and imagination is that the zoning board are very well practiced in handling uh, duplex uh, conversations. And I don't think there's anything that, uh, from the neighborhood's point of view anyway, that uh, anybody here is uh, overly concerned about. OK. All right, Pam, what other projects were there? You said there were three? Sure, no, two, two. Okay. Um, and the other one that I am aware of is at 408 Northampton Road, which has an existing special permit. So that's Aspen Heights, if you're familiar with Aspen Heights. Um, so it's an apartment building with 88 units. 11 of those are affordable. Um, it's in the PRP zoning district. And like I said, it already has a special permit uh, and they're coming back to the ZBA. They're looking to update some of their conditions. Um, specifically, they want to take some Siberian spruce trees down that are part of the landscape plan um, without the requirement of having to replace them. They also in their 2019 special permit, they have a condition that they need to run a shuttle service um, year round to UMass. And so they are proposing to change that to only run the shuttle service to UMass um, during the regular academic year. So there would be no shuttle service to UMass during summer, spring, um, or winter breaks. Um, and then the last one that I am aware of, there is a condition saying that they need to have 24 hour security guard. Um, and they are proposing that they would not have a live in security guard, but that instead there would be a hotline number that all the residents would be given the phone number. Um, so after the business hours, so when the regular business office is closed, residents would need to call um, the special hotline number for support. Okay. 
So and again, members. Nate, yeah. if you have anything to add, please, please do. All right. Any of those sound intriguing board members? Okay. I'm not seeing any expressions of interest. Okay. So we'll pass on that. All right, uh, time is 8.33. Uh, item eight on our agenda, do we have any SPP, SPR, or SUB applications coming? I'm aware of two, and Nate might be aware of more than that. Um, AutoZone is coming, and they're putting solar panels on their roof, and they also want to put solar panels on their side yard, and they're needing a special site plan review for that. Um, so that's going to be coming. And then um, Vista Terrace, which is a cluster subdivision in South Amherst, um, a homeowner there wants to um, build a pergola and also has put in a shed. So she's coming to have site plan review because that development is uh, a cluster subdivision and had to get a site plan review approval. And those are the two that I can remember. Is there anything else, Nate? Uh, Eversource. Oh, Eversource. Yeah. Coming for changes to the substation down on College Street. So they're they're going to be putting in switch gear, uh, new switch gear, which is really it looks like a, almost like you know like those pod storage units. Uh, it's a pretty large uh, enclosed structure um, to the if you're looking at the building to the right of it in front of where they already have you know uh, the transformers and um, capacitors and so. That they have an application in, so I think those three are the three that the two Chris mentioned and, and Eversource are something that would be coming up in the next, you know, month or so. Uh, okay, great. All right, planning uh, board committee and liaison reports. Bruce, PVPC. Nothing to report. All right. Uh, Andrew is not here to tell us about CPAC. Tom, anything on DRB? Yeah, we had some um, some signage for a, a, a glass shop that is kind of around back. Um, at, I'm trying to think, it's on North Pleasant, 96 North Pleasant, and some updating signs, which is pretty simple. And there's a new uh, Blue Mango Dessert Cafe that's coming in. Um, Next to where Bart's was, where the where Coronation Cafe Coronation, yeah, is um, and so we looked at some signs and gave some recommendations, and they're coming back with some updates um, in a coming meeting. But otherwise, just some small things like that. Okay, thank you. Janet is absent uh, for solar bylaw. Uh, Chris, anything? Uh, Anything you would add from your participation? I, I know you mentioned the, Z, the GZA uh, solar siting survey. Um, we're making our way through the solar bylaw slowly and we have um, things that we're discussing like setbacks and um, what do we do if forest is cleared? Do we require that mitigation be provided elsewhere and different things like that? Um, so one of these days we'll have to bring our draft to the planning board and get your thoughts about it. Um, the siting survey is going to be presented to, I think it's coming out um, in the next couple of weeks and the report will be out with MAP and IT is working with um, GCA to prepare a map that has um, interactive features. So we're hoping that we'll be able to show on this map, the map, sh the GCA map shows where is it feasible to put solar in town. And we're hoping to add to it features like um, how does that relate to where we have prime farmland and things like that. So we'll be able to determine, you know, is prime farmland in danger of being overcome with solar arrays, things, yeah, that type of thing. So yeah, stay tuned. Great, great. And then CRC, Chris. And CRC is considering the um, zoning bylaw that you, the zoning amendment that you reviewed tonight. Um, I can't remember when they're considering it again, but they're 
kind of tracking along with you. And I don't think they're going to make a decision until after the planning board has made a recommendation. That's been their pattern. I think what if they close their public hearing and, and make a recommendation uh, too soon, then they get into a problem of having to have um, a second public hearing. So I think they'll wait until you make a recommendation. OK. OK. Uh, so that's the planning. That's the committee and liaison reports. Uh, report of chair. I really don't have a report this evening. Um, Chris, do you have any report of staff? Um, my only report is that I'll be away for a while, starting in late May, and um, the planning board has a tentative meeting set for May thirty first. And I, I guess that's the third meeting of the month. So I would recommend that you cancel that one unless something comes up that we're absolutely in dire need for it. And then for the um, 7th of June, that would be handled by Nate and Pam if that meeting is needed. And you'd be in good hands with Nate and Pam. They did this last year when I was away. So um, all right. yeah, that's it. That's all okay. I have to report. Thank you. All right, time is 8.39. Does anybody have anything else they'd like to say this evening? Otherwise, we can adjourn. All right, thank you all. So, you. so the homework is to review the rest of the, the uh, bylaw proposal so we can talk about the rest of it and all of it. Thank you. All right, good night. Thank you, Doug. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Pam. Bye, goodbye. Thank you. And made a good night.